Well, you are an amazing congregation, and God has blessed us through you and through the years, thankful for what He has done. And you know, one of the things that really impacts me as I think about First Baptist Church of Garland, not just that you're able as a congregation to keep your focus on the right things, which is our purpose and our mission, but it's, it's the way you carry out God's commands. You do so with a great spirit, a harmony among us. You're not a contentious church. So some churches are, and you're not a contentious church. There's no one trying to run the church. Uh, we're focused on the mission that God has given to us, and I thank you for that. Today is what we call Vision Sunday where we're looking at our vision into the future that includes unveiling our future facility needs here at First Baptist Church. There is a tremendous legacy here, 156 years, second oldest church and Baptist church in Dallas County. And today, 2024, we're going to see that the legacy continues. First of all, on your outline, look at letter A, Jesus' final two statements. Sometimes the final words that people say before they die are, are vitally important. And especially with somebody like Jesus, who was the greatest person ever lived. What were the last words he spoke? And why did he speak them? Well, he made two statements before he, he ascended to heaven and left earth. And I want us to look at both of those because both of them are vitally important. The first statement comes in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. You'll see it on the screen here. And Jesus came and said to them, verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, there are a lot of things he could have said as his final statement. He could have said, go to church. Yeah, that's important. He didn't say that. He could have said, read your Bible. It's important. He didn't say that. He could have said, love one another. Don't judge. Could have said that. Could have said, be sure you tithe. He didn't say that. Final words before he left. All authority is mine because he had risen from the grave. Go. Teach. Baptize. Disciple, observe everything that I've commanded you, and I am with you as you go. Powerful words. And then his second statement, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You'll see it on the screen. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and at the end of the earth. Jesus had resurrected from the grave, walked the earth 40 days, gone to the Mount of Olives. Disciples had followed him. There he is. They're just about to watch him. Feet lift off the ground and ascend through the clouds and into heaven. They're about to watch all of this. And the final words out of his mouth was, you will be my witnesses. Beginning where you are, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, into the earth. And then he left. Now you may ask, Pastor, if, if going is so important, why don't we just spend all of our money going around the world and, and not worrying about our facilities here? Let's just go. That's a good question. But I want you to see this morning how Jesus structured his command and how the early church fulfilled his command. Did you notice there was a concentric circles? Jerusalem. And then out from Jerusalem is Judea. That's the region. And out from Judea is Samaria. That's the area. And then the uttermost part of the world. It's almost as if you toss a rock 
into Jerusalem, the pebbles go out. Look at, this, look at this diagram. You'll see, you will be my witnesses. It's almost as if the pebble, the impact is made in Jerusalem. And as the impact is made there, the ripple effects go to Judea, which is our Texas, and Samaria, which would be the United States, and the world. So that's how he designed it. And that's what happened. The church in Jerusalem was key. That was home base. The local church from which the entire world was impacted in the book of Acts. So people would start out at the church in Jerusalem. They would go literally to all around the region, the Roman Empire and Asia Minor, and they would go on mission trips and they would come back and they would establish churches and they would come back. So Jerusalem was the geographical and the spiritual center, the key church in the book of Acts. It was home base. It was headquarters. And the church in Jerusalem played a key role in the book of Acts. There you see it in chapter 9 playing a part in Saul's conversion. And there you see it in chapter 6 with one of their deacons being the first martyr for the faith, which is Stephen. And there you see it in chapter 10, church of Jerusalem playing a key role in the gospel going to the Gentiles of Peter's vision. And then you turn a few pages and you read that church in Jerusalem was the one collecting the offering because a famine had hit Judea. And churches were in need. And it was Jerusalem that stepped up to collect the offering. And the church in Jerusalem mentioned repeatedly in Paul's letters. So, the church in Jerusalem was home base for years of gospel work. The headquarters, central to mission work because their pastor, Peter, and co-pastor, James, were strong leaders. And people would go to the known world and go back to Jerusalem because it was home base. And you see, folks, that's the model we follow here at First Baptist Church. We literally go around the world. We have more than 30 partnerships on five of the seven continents. But this is home base. This is headquarters. This is our Jerusalem. This is, this is where we start. So it's, you got to have a strong base to go to the world. For years at First Baptist Church, we have known for some time in the future, one of these days, we're going to have to address our building needs here at the church. We knew that. It's been a long time since we built a worship center. The one you're sitting in was built in 1955. 69 years. 69 years. When we built this, I wasn't here then. But when we built this, gasoline was 23 cents a gallon. And minimum wage was a dollar an hour. And ABC had just premiered a new television show everybody loved. The name of it was The Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Still popular, isn't it? And there was a song that was popular the year we built this. It hit the airwaves and everybody loved it. The title of it was The Yellow Rose of Texas. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since we built, hasn't it? 69 years. And the Hunt Building, which is the Hunt Hallway, if you go out this door and turn right, the oldest hallway here in classrooms, it was built then. And then the chapel was built in 1977, 47 years ago, hasn't been touched. And the parlor, 47 years ago. And so we, we don't build real often. We have discussed for years plans to build, and <clears throat> to be honest, some of our leadership of the church wanted to go forward before now. But I was the one holding us back because I, I just didn't feel it was the right time. I want to be in step with God. I don't want to be in front of Him. I don't want to be behind Him. I want to be in step with Him. And, and I just didn't feel it was the right time. And then COVID hit. But now, as we begin 2024, folks, it's the right time. It's the right time that we address our facility needs here at First Baptist Church. And the first step is the concept I'm presenting to you today in the capital fundraising campaign. 
But you may ask, do we, what are the needs and why do we have the needs to build? Well, let me look at letter B on your outline there, the need. Let's, let's look at it. The need for new facilities is never more obvious than when it rains. You notice that? Whenever it rains, it's supposed to tonight, you'll see buckets out everywhere and trash cans because we've tried fixing this roof many times and it's, we can't. And you'll see ceiling tiles that are stained. And so it's not that we're in a tent of it, it's that we replace them and it rains again. And they're stained again. And our need is never greater than when it's cold. Last Sunday in the worship center, sometimes we have trouble with the heater or sometimes we don't. Last Sunday is 58 degrees in here. I was glad I was in Romania where it's warmer. Um, the parlor, the chapel this morning, hallways, pretty cold, pretty early. Our maintenance team does the best job they can. I did, seriously, they did a tremendous job of keeping things going. Yeah. It's just an older building. And so you say, well, pastor, let's just remodel the worship center. We could. But that's not our only need. We have needs in here. But we have needs in the hunt hallway, in the chapel, in the parlor, in the offices, in the atrium. And so you, you could do remodeling and remodel this and remodel that and remodel that and remodel that. Architects looked at that. It's cheaper to put everything under one building. So here are some of the needs, not an exhaustive list of some of the areas. Let's look. First of all, the worship center. We have continuous plumbing issues here with the restrooms in the back. Stained glass windows are very thin. They're starting to break. Foundation issues. Gutters not accessible to clean as needed. Oak doors are in desperate need of refurbishing. And nothing in here is ADA compliant. The ramp to the stage, back stairwells to the balcony are too steep. Restrooms are too small to be compliant. Have you ever wondered how we change light bulbs in here? How many Baptists that take change a light bulb? Yeah, everybody's yeah. <laughs> Did you notice there are no catwalks? So every time we have to change a light bulb, we rent a forklift and change them. Let's look at other needs we have. That's not, that's the worship center. Hot hallway. Foundation issues. Bathrooms no longer work due to sewer line collapse. Accordion doors need to be replaced. Three different color carpet in the 150 hallway alone. Back stairs from room 150 to 250 creak as you go up them. Lack of insulation affects HVAC efficiency and comfort level. Then we go to the chapel. Not been remodeled or updated since it was built in 1977. The bell on top has never worked due to weight and roof issues. Did you know there was a bell on top? Gutter system needs to be totally reworked. No ramp to the stage for ADA. Lighting and sound systems are failing, and some parts are no longer available. HVAC systems failing. Very limited crawl space in the ceiling. Electrical system is in need of repair. Let's go to the parlor. Limited crawl space above the ceiling for electrical work. Lighting system is failing, and some parts are no longer available. Our atrium out here, skylights are leaking. Needs to be updated. If you've ever tried to walk through there, it's kind of shoulder to shoulder. Need some room. Office area, the HVAC system it's not engineered correctly. Foundation issues causing the doors to stick. Restrooms not ADA compliant. Lack of a proper server room. The HVAC was added to this room causing issues in the south side offices. These are just some of the things all around. Have you noticed the outside of the building is starting to fade and rust in places and black mold along the bricks? So that's actually the seventh area outside. This is an amazing facility to be as old as it is. The needs are there. Any of your Sunday school classrooms overcrowded? <laughs> a lot of them. We need some space. Another issue about older buildings is how much it costs to maintain it. Do you know how much that we've spent just to maintain our buildings the last five years? One million dollars. Just to maintain them. And it'll get worse. 
Another consideration, have you noticed the newly remodeled and vibrant downtown Garland? It's nice, doesn't it? $423 million bond, and a lot of it was to redo downtown and businesses, and $30 million just spent on a new residential area for West Garland, and people are coming, and businesses are coming, and apartments are coming, and as a church, folks, we have felt led to stay downtown, not relocate. This is where God's placed us. So a new vibrant facility at First Baptist Church could be the gateway to an attractive downtown Garland. We're a stable church. Stable finances, stable members, stable ministers and staff. We've been here forever. Stability. Stability is good. And here's another thought. Newer, vibrant facilities attract because they send a message. When people drive by on Avenue D, the message is, that's not a church for the past. It's a church for the future and for generations to come. And young families would want their children to be involved in a church that's looking at the future. And in 1955... They built this to look to the future because they saw you. Now, it's our job for the next generation to see them. So, what's the plan? Let's go to letter C on your outline, the plan. Well, we've been meeting with architects and praying for a number of years, quite a few years, in fact, after considering many different architects, our building and properties and finance committee went with Beck Architecture. Beck was the one that had done a lot, of, a lot of new churches in Dallas. They recently did First Baptist Dallas, and they're very familiar with Dallas and building churches here. The Paul Gage Group has been enlisted for our capital campaign, and we looked at all options with our architects. We looked at remodeling, remodeling every single piece, and that was much more costly to do it that way. We looked at building a freestanding worship center across the street, across Glenbrook, with a sky bridge to connect the two. Cool concept, but much more expensive, and you still have this older building to maintain, which gets costly. So, the plan that meets our needs the best and is the most cost-effective, not cheap, but the most cost-effective is the one I'm going to show you in just a moment. In 2023, last year, our Building and Properties Committee, along with our Finance Committee, met with our architect, and both committees voted unanimously to proceed with this plan that I'm going to show you in just a moment. Uh, I also enlisted from among our membership what was called an advisory team. The advisory team cannot vote. They have no voting powers. It's just those in our church who have expertise, some architects and, and uh, builders and engineers and bankers in real estate and just some people who have expertise along the way that can give us advice. And they did. So, the plan is to build a new 1,200-seat worship center on this location. House under one roof, a new chapel, a new parlor, new offices, new Sunday school classrooms, a new atrium, and larger hallways. That's the plan. Now, whenever the architects start doing their work, here's what we told them. As you begin to design, we want to stay who we are. There's a tremendous heritage here. We don't want to lose that heritage. We'll stay who we are. Same color scheme, same brick scheme, still look like a traditional church, similar to our pre-existing church that we're in now, bring elements of our current building over to the new building like stained glass windows and symbols of our faith. Don't lose our heritage. We will still have two services. We will still have a traditional and we will still have a contemporary. 
platform would be larger. We can do more things. Whenever we have an orchestra, the orchestra will be on the stage with us and we won't have to fold up chairs and move them every time. The trend now in building churches is this, that you make it not look like a church. Maybe trick people and get them in there. It's a church! (laughs) We tell the architects, don't do that. We want to look like a church. We're not ashamed of being a church. And we want to look like a church. So, we want symbols of faith around We want the architecture to go skyward. We want a lighted cross. As people drive by, we want them to know we're a church because we're not ashamed of the gospel. So, they went to work. Here's the concept that that they came up with that our committees unanimously agreed upon. Now, I'm going to show it in just a moment, and, and as you look at it, don't go, wait a minute, I didn't see this, I didn't see that. It's not a finished product yet, okay? It's a design. There will be additions, there will be deletions, there will be modifications. So just, you know, don't, don't fill out my e- email tomorrow with, I didn't see this, I didn't see this. Okay, it's just a design. But it gives you an idea. So here's the animation of what we're looking at. First Baptist Church of Garland, the gateway to a newly remodeled and thriving downtown Garland. Looking to the future and the next generations with a facility worthy of the great God whom we serve. The cornerstone of biblical truth in a world desperately needing it. base from which we impact our community, state, and world. Expanding the kingdom of God, beginning right here, West Avenue D in Garland. A facility to attract men and women, boys and girls, where they are welcomed, loved, ministered to, and taught God's Word. First Baptist Church of Garland, strong heritage, and a bright future, standing for biblical truth for generations to come. So that's the plan, the concept design of what we're looking at. You may ask, what are we going to do while they're doing that here for worship? We will be worshiping in the uh, fellowship hall for just over a year, is what they're telling us. Uh, So we'll have to move some Sunday school classes around as well from here, relocate some things because there were some that will be affected here as well. Flexibility is is going to be the key. What is the cost? Well, 2023 architects estimated for us. The cost would be somewhere between 26 and 28 million dollars to do this. We have no indebtedness. Uh, We have about five million saved. Uh, Some of you continue to give to future building campaigns even when we weren't building because you saw this day coming. Thank you for that. Some of the overages we've had for in budget, we were allowed to put to this. And so we have about five million saved toward it. Um, The cost, we don't know for sure. That's what we were told then because as you know, building costs in Dallas-Fort Worth continue to escalate. So the sooner we build it, the cheaper it'll be. But still, I mean, we don't know the exact cost because it depends on when we build it. So I've got good news and bad news this morning. The good news is we we have enough money to build this. The bad news is it's still in your pockets. That's (laughs) That's the bad news. (laughs) 
No, just teasing. Uh, there, will, there will be an information meeting. There will be more information. We have information meetings starting on February 12th that will go through March. And so every member uh, will encourage you to come. About, about 10 different meetings that way. Maybe you can work with your schedule. They're, all the meetings are the same, so there's no need to come to more than one. But I would like for every single member of our church, any guests that want to come, come to at least one of them. We'll put the, when they're, when they're going to be located, where they're located, when, time, and all that. I'll be at all 10 of them. But we want you to come to at least one of them for more information and to plan a, more details about, about the campaign. Also, whenever you leave today, our ushers will have, and also at the Welcome Center, uh, it's called the Lexi Continues, and it is a key dates campaign, campaign card. So please make a note of that and grab one of those uh, whenever you leave today. Now, a couple of the things. One, we have about 1,200 people here on Sunday mornings, and that means we're going to have 1,300 opinions on how to do this. I don't like the color of the carpet. You sure we got the right architect. I don't like the pew design. You're, they're just going to be all over the board. With this many people, every single person can't get their way because there's no telling what it would look like after that. So everybody is not going to get their way and everyone's not going to be able to, you know, maybe what you feel is important may be in there. So be flexible and be godly. Let me say one more thing uh, I think it's important. God willing, I'll be here as your pastor. I'm not going to lead us into this, and I'm gone. I'll be here, committed to be here through this. It's important, I think, for pastors to be here through, through campaigns like this, and I will. I've had opportunities, other churches have called and said, would you come be our pastor, and, and I haven't felt led to do that. Um, had opportunities to teach at a university in theology and, and full-time, leave here. But I haven't done that because you, you're my first priority. You're my first calling. I'll, I've called the local church first, and I still feel called to the local church. And God has called me here. This is, of course, my 19th year. But I will be here uh, through this. I think it's important that you hear me say that because I believe this is where God has placed me to serve and nowhere else. Now, Having said that, let me share with you, before I close, the vision. Letter D on your outline, 10 values of First Baptist Church. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. I don't want you perishing. We have vision here. Here are our emphases, 10 things that we're going to emphasize. Number one, we're going to be unashamedly biblical, unashamed of this book. I know in our culture, there are times churches or denominations or people look and go, oh, I know it says that, but I, that's not our day. This is our final authority. We're not going to be ashamed of that. First Baptist Church of Garland, this is God's Word, and we're going to stand on it, unashamedly biblical in all we do. Number two, strong preaching, teaching, and worship. It may not look like it, but every Sunday I, I really work hard on, on the sermon. I think it's vital for a church to have strong biblical teaching and preaching that teaches you the Word of God, whether you want to hear it or not, and just say, here's what God has told us. I work hard on that. I will continue to work hard on that. It will continue to be a priority to me that every single Sunday when I stand here, I have God's message for you. That's important to me and I think important to our church. But we also are going to have strong Sunday school teachers here as we do now. We'll continue to have that. Mark and Clay continue to produce strong worship here. Those are going to be values that when you show up on Sunday, you experience God and you hear from God. Number three, fulfilling the Great Commission. I read it just a moment ago. That's the command that Jesus gave to our church is to go preach, baptize, disciple, and teach. That's our purpose. Folks, hear me. Listen to me. If all we do is build a new building, we failed. Because that's not our purpose. It's our base. It's important. But every time you show up, the building is not going to be our gospel. Our gospel is going to be our mission that Jesus told us before he left. Here's what I want you to do. He's the boss. So we're going to be about 
what he told us to do. Number four, mission work is a priority. First Baptist Church has always been a mission church. I didn't mention this in the video a moment ago, but did you know whenever the church started in 1868, six months later it established its first mission church? Six months! They're just getting going themselves. And out at Pleasant Valley, they started First Baptist Church at Pleasant Valley as a mission church. We've always been about missions. And we always will. We're going to pray, we're going to give, we're going to go. Many of you have gone on mission trips. Of course, I just, we just got back, and many of you have been to Romania before and other places. We have more than 30 partnerships around the world, and you go on those. And then we have their leaders here staying for six, months, six uh, weeks or two months or three months, and you house them in your homes. This church has always been about missions, and we always will be. Number five. Getting outside of the walls and meeting needs. Several years ago, I was, I was praying and, and visiting with the Lord, and I said, God, you know, a lot of churches around First Baptist Church are dying. Churches that used to run what we run, they're closing their doors, and they're selling their buildings, and whew, I can name about five or six right here that used to run what we run. So how do we keep that from happening here, Lord? And I really believe that he led me to service. When you get outside of yourself and you get outside the building and you serve others and you meet needs, God will keep us vital. Because whenever Jesus came, he came as a servant, not to be ministered to, but to minister, give his life as a ransom for many. So we're always going to emphasize getting outside these stained glass windows and not just staying here and seeing hymns, which is good, and choruses to the Lord. That's only part of it. When the door is open and the service ends, we need to be in the community meeting needs. And so we do through Friendship House and Code Cares and school initiatives and things like that. We're starting in our Jerusalem. We're always going to be getting outside the walls. Number six, a house of prayer. Matthew 21, 13, Jesus ran the money changers out of the temple, and he said, you, you're making my house a den of thieves. My house is to be a house of prayer. And yes, it was a play on words, but still he was making a point. There's no way we should build a new facility and it not be what Jesus said it should be. It was a house of prayer. I would love for people in our community to say, I want First Baptist Church praying for me because God listens to them. Number seven, a minister training center. We unveiled this to you a couple of months ago. We have felt led to partner with some theological institutions around us, four of them, and we are going to be training the next generation of ministers here starting our first semester will be in the fall of this year, 2024. I'm excited about it. I think God's going to use that to help us train ministers for the days to come, the years to come. Number eight, family church for all ages. We have all generations here at First Baptist Church represented, and, and that's good because healthier, stronger churches have all generations there, not just one. Some churches have all older people, and they're missing some elements. And some churches have all young people, 18 to 30, and they're missing elements. They're missing finances. They're missing wisdom. The church that's the strongest has all generations there. And we are a multi-generational church. There are some of you, your great-grandparents are members here, and your parents are members here, and <laughs> you're a member here, and your kids are members here, and multi-generations, but that's good. It's good. A lot of stability. Number nine, our ninth value is ethnic diversity. Ethnic diversity. Over the last few years, more ethnicities have started to come. I'm so glad. We used to just be all white. 
Now we have Hispanic and we have African American and we have African and we have Orientals. And that's good because that's what heaven looks like. And that's what Garland looks like. 52 languages spoken within a 25 minute drive time of our church. That's who's out there. That's how you should be here. And number 10, our 10th value is a place to heal. Now, I'll be honest with you, we did not plan this. This is nothing that our ministers sat around a table and said, you know, let's be a place to heal. That it was not even on our radar. But God, God developed that among us. What I mean by that is there are a lot of people who have come to our church the last few years who have been hurt in other churches. I mean, deep hurt. They'll tell me about it and tears just roll down their cheeks. Something happened. I don't know what it is. It's various in different churches. But they have lost their love for the Lord. Their zeal. They've lost a lot of things. And they come here, and God uses this church to be a healing bond for them. I don't know how many times I've heard the last two years, families, tears streaming down their faces go, Pastor, I love coming to church again. I love being active in church again. So God has brought them to us. We didn't go seeking anybody. This is not a design plan of us. This is what God's done. And you need to look, see where he's at work. You join him in it. So he's working to bring people here to heal. And I want us to continue to be that safe, strong, biblically centered church that lets people love church again. So, 156 years strong. But we're not just a church for the past. We have a powerful vision with God-honoring facilities for the future. Somebody said one time, a vision of what could be is fueled by a conviction of what should be. And that's us. Look at this picture one more time. That's us. A vision of what could be is fueled by a conviction of what should be. So folks, with the Bible as our center, we go forward. All that he has for us. And I look forward to doing it with you. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you today for your leadership and your guidance. You're a good God. You've blessed this church and you've been with us for many, many years. And Father, just as we sang today, just as you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. And so, Lord, I pray that we will trust you. We, we don't know how it's going to happen. We look at those, those figures and we go, well, that's a lot. We don't know how it's going to happen. But, Lord, you tell us in your word that you are a God who is able to do much more than we even ask or think. So we take you at your word today. God, would you bless our future? But Father, I also realize there are probably people here this morning that they, they have hurts and needs right now. Some of them need Jesus right now. Some of them need a recommitment of their lives right now. Some of them need to turn back to your ways and start walking with you again. I pray that will happen. In Jesus' name, amen.